You're listening to Season 2, Episode 5 of the Attempt Adventure Podcast, a podcast all about travel, finding adventure every day, and seeking out adventurous ways to make life more interesting. From Boulder, Colorado, I'm your host, James Barrett, joined as always by my co-host, Michael DeRosiers in Bangkok, Thailand. Very good. How well, you been, James, Michael? I'm doing well. How are you, sir? What's up? Oh, I'm We're doing back on good. Schedule. I almost said, yeah, I almost said Bangkok when I was doing the... Doing they the do. Intro, like, they uh, do both start with the letter B, so that's, that's good enough for me to get them confused. I don't. He is for Bangkok. That's good enough for me. C <laughs> uh, is for cookie, which is indeed good enough for me. Well, James, in this episode, we're going to be sitting down with special guest Linda King from the Smart Travelista to talk about travel, health, and safety. A lot of times when we're talking about traveling and, and adventure, we think about these, you know, the exciting parts, the glamorous side of travel. But there's a very real practical side of it that kind of gets overlooked, and that is keeping yourself safe and keeping yourself healthy. So we're going to be having a fantastic conversation. Uh, Linda King has been all around the world. She's written books about the subject, about health and safety on the road, as well as other books. And so that's the topic of our interview today, and it's a great one. But first, James... Did you do anything new or adventurous this week? Well, went to the farmer's market. It was the first nice. one of the season. Tried a new restaurant. It was pretty good. Bad Daddy's Burger Bar. Sounds Shout out great. the one in Flat Ice Crossing Mall. Okay. Shout out to you guys. <laughs> Shout out to Bad Daddy's Burger Bar. <laughs> if you're listening, besides that, it's just, it's really just been work. My time there is coming to a close. Yeah, you just have like soon. a what a week and a half left, huh? It's kind of crazy at the moment, and so I'm spending way more time there than I would like. Right. But the most adventurous thing I will say I did is there is a little tiny game trail that leads up the mountain a little ways, mm -hmm. sort of off to the side. And I did go up there and took some pictures. So oh, I'll nice. share those with you guys. Nice. So what what is your plan after the twentieth? Uh, looking for a new job. We're going to yeah. take a. A trip down back home for a little bit, see the family and stuff like that, and sort of nice, yeah. go from there. I'm okay money wise for a few months, so I'm not crazy worried about it. I took this job with the implication that it would go from being temporary, like contract to year round. That is not the case. So that was a little bum. That was a bummer. Right. But yeah. Is what it is. And sure. you just got to find the best in it and move on. Yeah. So. I'm not sure that's the best yeah. way to put it. What's next, but something good. Well, Hey, I, I'm right there with you. I've, I've been job hunting and actually doing some interviews lately as well with this, this war in Ukraine teaching online, no longer pays the bills. My bread and butter were honestly Russian students. And nowadays they can't use visa, MasterCard or PayPal. They're unable to pay me. So they can't hire me to teach. Uh, and they were, you know, they were the ones that yep. were kind of willing to spend more per hour mm -hmm. so unfortunately you can't work for free no no you absolutely can't and it's like i understand that like this is the smallest of losses of this war right i i almost hesitate <laughs> even complaining about it because like come on you know you know considering that people are losing their lives and their homes but it still is is really not good and it still does affect me so i, yeah, I actually does, got it affects your livelihood yeah I did get a job offer, but it was at a school and it was going to be really good, but it was at a school that was going to take like almost an hour both ways to get there. And that would have been bad. And I would have had to pay a taxi each day for like an hour. So it, it just, that wasn't oh, going to be worth it. And then, uh, I've done a couple other interviews anything. since. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll see how things go, but I'm there with yeah, you. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll find something. I'm sure yeah. mm -hmm. it'll be good. Things will turn out. All right. Things always turn out. They all right. always do. Well, this week, James, I, decided to do something. I had a little extra time. So I decided to do my wilderness first aid certification, my WFA. I did it online, <laughs> but Hey, it's, it's a, it's a, it counts. It, it's kind of helped, you know, motivate me to get back out there. And I just feel like it's important mm -hmm. to know. I don't know. It's just good to be fresh with these things. You know, I think that's why they have you get recertified for first aid every, you know, three to five years or whatever. Oh, yeah. Because it's really easy to just sort of forget things you and panic just forget if and, something yeah. happens. I mean, I've never had to administer first aid in my life besides like cuts, mm -hmm. you know, cuts or, or minor things. It's good to know. And I mean, a lot of it was very North America centric because I was getting it from a North American organization. I'm not going to meet many like black bears here in Thailand. 
but still just like the principles are sound you do so, have tigers there yes but probably nowhere probably nowhere where i would be i'm not sure how many there are well, let's see how many tigers i feel like if a tiger decides to get you it doesn't really matter at that point well there are fewer than 200 tigers in the whole country so i would be supremely unlucky oh. to meet one <laughs> it's not impossible yeah <laughs> really only that's that few that's kind of that's a bummer it is sad but uh, we were in a place with tigers because they told us to look out for them true they did uh, mm-hmm. it says mostly they live at the national parks but anyway, so yeah, I got my wilderness first aid. And if I ever have the time and the money, I might go on to get that next level, which is wilderness first responder, which is a bit more intensive. Mm. I've been spending more time outdoors, both in the U.S. and here in Thailand. So I just yeah. I think it's good to good to be fresh. Yeah, that with first them. responder I mean, one. That's cool because then you can like be part of search and rescues and things you can. like that. I think it, it gives you like a level three search and rescue certification as well if you have your WFR Although I'm not sure how much help I'd be here in Thailand, <laughs> needing someone to translate everything for me. <laughs> but um, Like when those kids got stuck in that cave. Yes, yes. And then Elon Musk wanted to build a submarine and everyone was like, no, man, we don't have time for that. Just like send some divers in. We don't have time to construct a submarine. <laughs> it's like, thanks for your intentions, but please just send some scuba gear. Like that's exactly, what we need. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's good. I mean, obviously I did that stuff with Boy Scouts, but that was a long time ago. So it's good to just refresh, like how to make a splint, what to do for heat stroke, you know, all that good stuff. How to scare off animals. Be big or be small or back away yeah. or, or charge them. <laughs> it depends on the animal. If it's a bear, right? If it's black, fight back. If it's brown, lay down. That's that's what you do. If it's white, so if it's- good night. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Uh, fortunately, neither one of us live anywhere with polar bears. So that is the one that I learned way back. For those of you who may be in a place that doesn't have predatory animals, mm-hmm. which I guess would be the UK, I don't think. Parts does. of Europe, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, parts of Europe. There are two large land animals known to actively hunt people that is, polar bears and mountain lions. Oh, the U.S. Are... doesn't have polar bears. Yeah. Well, do they? Do they? I mean, maybe like in Alaska. No, but we do have mountain lions. Yeah, and mountain lions live near people, and they they hunt for fun too. <laughs> like they don't just hunt for food. Yeah, no, like, they'll they... actually like <laughs> toy with you because they're just a big cat. And they sound terrifying. Yeah, and they're not that rare. It's not like a tiger. Like they're actually around. You know. Let's see. I'm curious before we get into the interview conservation. So wilderness first aid, if you're attacked by a mountain lion, first you have to make yourself look big and scary. But if it starts coming at you, you just have to fight back. Never run. If you turn your back to it, you're dead. So you just have to fight back, kick and punch and be as loud as you can. See, the thing is, most big cats in the world are endangered. Mountain lions are not. Mm -hmm. No, they're all over the place. Mountain lions are not. And they're they're protected because they are very, very important to the ecosystem Mm -hmm. where they live. They were listed as threatened for a while up until 2008 where their population increased enough to where now they are just animals and yeah they are one of my favorite animals they're cool i mean it's it seems any, they seem, any big cat that lives in the mountains is cool they, they almost seem too exotic for the u.s does that make sense well the u.s has jaguars <laughs> oh i know i know even southern like, texas has texas jaguars. east <laughs> southern texas east texas has jaguars Florida has panthers, which is just a, it is a mountain lion, but it's not. It's like a subspecies. <laughs> what do you yeah. say we get into this interview? Well, that's actually a pretty good segue because speaking of wilderness first aid, here we have, ladies and gentlemen, Linda King, the smart travelista, here to talk about travel health and safety, as well as to share some of her own travel health and safety tips, her experiences, her adventures. We also talk a little bit about her travels during COVID. It's made traveling very difficult, so she has taken the chance to explore her own home, Australia. So enjoy the interview. Welcome back to the show. Today I am very happy to be joined by Linda King, world traveler, writer, travel blogger, and the smart travelista. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. So glad to have you. Well, the first thing we always like to have our guests do is introduce themselves, of course. So why don't you just tell us just a little bit about who you are, what you do, where you're living, and what is your background with travel and adventure? 
as Michael's just said, I'm a author, travel writer and blogger. Um, that's my side hustle. So I do have a full-time job uh, where I manage people um, at, at, at a, a company, other company. Um, but I'm based in Melbourne, Australia, originally born in Sydney. And what got me into the travel, um, I started travelling as a child, um, which I can tell you about a little bit later. But that sort of gave me the um, the taste of travel. So I ended up getting into travel as a career. So I, was, I worked for an airline um, I was a travel agent there for quite a few years. Travel's always been in my blood. What have been some of your uh, favourite places that you've been? There's so many places in the world. The world's such an amazing place. Um, I'd have to say probably Europe is probably my favourite place. But look, you know, the States and, and Asia, they're all great too. Um, but I seem to have a bit of an affinity with, with Europe. The adventures I've been on, I've been on so many. Um, probably the first one I can remember as a child was we went on a, a four-month road trip around Australia with my parents and my brother, and that was just totally amazing. As a child, you you know, don't know about travel, and we went on a road trip. I think we were most excited about not having to be at school for four months. <laughs> I'm um, sure. <laughs> as, as a kid. Um, but then what we didn't realise is our father had gone to the teachers and we'd actually had a homework so he presented us with homework to do every night. No escape. <laughs> um, yeah, but it just really opened my eyes to what sort of adventures you could have in life, right? Every day was an adventure when we were on the road um, and it was something that we'd never seen. So I think for me, what adventure means for me is new exciting experiences, um, the unknown and being out of your comfort zone. Adventures are, are, are like the unknown, You've got to have them in life, don't you, you know, to make your life that more fruitful. And especially as a traveller, I think we we thrive on adventures. You know, what I find so interesting about that is that that's even just within your own country, finding all these new adventures as a child, even within your own country. How can people find these adventures locally? Because that's, well, that's one of the issues that everyone's having right now. We can't travel. Thanks to COVID-19, it's yeah. hard to travel. Uh, immigration anywhere is very difficult. There's a lot of requirements. Some countries just are completely closed off still. So mm. how can we still find adventure? What have you been doing to find adventure in these past two years? Yeah, so it's just about travelling locally, as you said. It's been hard for us and probably you as well. Um, you know, a lot of the borders, the state borders have been closed. So just about finding those untouched places that you might not have travelled to, like had you had the a chance to go international, well, that's obviously your first priority. Um, but and you sort of don't look at your own backyard, which was really interesting as a child because we did look at our own backyard. And Australia is such a big place. You, you think you only really concentrate on where you're living, but there's so much more to offer. So I think in a way it's been good for us to look at our own backyard because, you know, we, we should be looking at that before we travel further abroad. Well, what are some uh, hidden gems maybe that you've discovered this past year? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. I didn't prep you for these questions, but I'm just, uh, I'm curious now that we're on the topic. What are some hidden gems in Australia that you've discovered? Probably in Victoria or in Melbourne, where I am, there's a lot of uh, little wineries out at Yarra Valley. You know, you wouldn't really go there. Normally when you think of wineries, it's normally what I would do is go to Adelaide in South Australia. We've got, you know, the Barossa Valley down there. Um, but yeah, They've actually got some really nice wineries there, which I hadn't really investigated before. I, th I think, yeah, you just got to sort of look outside the box in a way. Because I've been really lucky. I've travelled a lot of Australia. Um, but then to find a hidden gem is like a really big treat because it's like, oh, haven't seen this before. Right. Yeah, so, but I, I'd say probably the wineries. Um, there's a really nice place in Victoria, sort of a little bit out of Victoria, which is a, a spa wellness place, which I think is really topical at the moment. Everyone wants to... Oh, yeah. worry about their wellness and health <laughs> exactly um yes yeah there's a really nice one outside of um victoria also the great ocean road's a really good one um it's on sort of on the coast it was the 12 apostles uh, which is no longer the 12 apostles because of weathering i think some of them have actually gone into the ocean but it's like a cliff um and it goes along the coastline um but that is a really lovely place um it always brings a lot of people so, yeah, there's just so much to offer. Um, you probably got the same in the US or well, you're in Thailand at the moment. Yes, um, yes. 
but yes, US there's so many great places there too. I guess uh, Australia, I would imagine, very similar to the US in that it really benefits from a road trip, right? I think that in the US anyway, you know, going by car is the best way to get around the country. Well, it's all good and well to talk about the great adventures where everything goes really nicely and it's a lot of fun. But sometimes the best stories come from when things just don't go right. You know, that's that's one of the most interesting questions I like to ask. What are some stories where things have gone wrong but have led you into an adventure? Some some adventure that started when maybe something uh, happened unexpectedly, something that you couldn't prepare for? Yeah, I was in Miami um, in the middle of a hurricane. Oh, gosh. Um, which I didn't expect. <laughs> right. Um, I, I was going there to, you know, to, uh, taste the local culture, do a bit of shopping, do a bit of beach, you know. Um, yeah, a hurricane hit um, and, and Miami Beach was right on the eye of it. They basically got on TV and said we need to evac- evacuate. So I had two options to go into a school building, which wasn't an option for me because I'd been out shopping and I had quite a number of bags with me, or, or, or to go to a, uh, another hotel more inland. I actually met some French guys and they couldn't speak English and they were totally distressed and I spoke a bit of French, so I was like, "Just come with me. We'll get in a we'll get in a cab. We'll find another hotel, and we'll sort it all out. Don't worry." So I took them under my wing. Um, I was a bit scared myself; it was a little bit scary. And so, yes, we went to this inland hotel. The only um, room that they had was on the top floor. I spent probably the next few days with the whole building shaking from the winds, even yeah. though we were inland. We I couldn't get out of Miami because of. What had happened everyone was trying to get out and they couldn't get out so terrifying but i think yeah but i think the big thing that i um got out of that was my resilience and ability to handle things that you know are unexpected so i think all those sorts of adventures when they go wrong actually build your character you and your strength sure. i think right part of your blog is about helping people not have a disaster, helping people to be yes. more prepared so that things don't go wrong. And you've written uh, several books about this. So please tell me about your books that you've written. Sure. Yeah. So I've got four books that I've written. So the first one's about finding the best travel bargains and managing your budget. So that one's really around investigating doing things online and, and those saving tips Yeah, and maybe not go to a travel agent to, to do your travel. Second one um, with best overseas bargain shopping. Shopping, So that's about the ways that you can save bargain shopping, but also the destinations, you know, my favourite destinations where I know a lot of bargain shopping happens, Thailand being one of them. Yes, in definitely. The book. <laughs> yeah. Num- book number three is how to increase your airline loyalty points and fly for free. I used to teach clients how to do this quite a lot when I was at the airline. Um, and I don't pay commercial at all anymore. I do do this all on points. So that's sort of the books around that. And the fourth book is how to protect your travel health and safety. So that's, I think, really very topical at the moment, especially yes. with what's going yes. on. And also just any of the books that I've written are about things that resonate with the traveller and that can help the traveller. Yeah, I think it can be really scary. Maybe if you don't have experience traveling, you know, where do you start? And I think that having someone that's been there, been there, done that, you know, that can offer advice is very comforting. And uh, even for experienced mm-hmm. travelers, right, picking up on pieces of advice from other travelers is really valuable. Yeah. Well, the uh, the last book that you mentioned about health and safety, that's one of the main topics that I wanted to talk to you about today. As you said, that's so important, especially nowadays with um, – mm-hmm. So many, you know, I think we've learned more about health in the last two years than we've ever thought about ever in the past. Mm. And it's such a big, I guess we could say a big limitation right now on travel. So uh, I wanted to ask you about some of your favorite travel tips for protecting one's health and safety while abroad or just while on a trip. Uh, How do you recommend people staying healthy? What are some of the tips and tricks that you have for staying healthy on a trip? Yeah, so I've got some health and safety tips, but the health trip tips would be if you're going to a, a developing country, get your vaccinations. Really important that you investigate that. Find out what vaccines you need because it's going to stop you. You know, it's not going to be a total guarantee, but it's going to help you be healthier while you're over there. Normally get that six weeks in advance. That's always the suggestion because sometimes you need multiple doses. Um, so that's probably one good tip. Um, take out travel insurance. Do not leave home without travel insurance. It's really, really important that you have that. I've been, and 
as everyone would have experienced, I've been sick on trips. You know, the medical is not the same. Like in Australia, we're really lucky. We've got cheap medical um, treatment. Some other countries don't have that luxury. Um, and you could be paying a lot of money if you need help. You know, I, um, this is such a great tip. I had never, I, I'd always gotten travel insurance when I was traveling around Southeast Asia, if I was going to Cambodia or something like that. I had never thought about it when I was going home to visit my family before. I just never considered it. I thought, oh, that's my home. I don't, I, it just never crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. Recently, I got to go back to the U.S. for the first time in a couple of years, and I decided to get health insurance, you know, traveler's insurance for my own home country. I've never needed it before. I've never had an instance when I needed it before, but wouldn't you know it, this time that I was home, I stepped on a nail and I had to go to an emergency room and have the wound cleaned. And I was so thankful that I had that travel mm -hmm. traveler's insurance because that could have cost me thousands of dollars. They would have had, they had to x-ray my foot and they had to you know, make sure there was mm -hmm. no rust left in the wound. And it was such an important thing that I had never considered previously. Yeah, and, and you know, if you've got the money to travel, then that should be part of the deal as far right. as I'm concerned. Right. I'm never not doing yeah. it again. <laughs> yes, I've always done it and I, I'm always glad that I've got it. And you, and it's yeah. insurance, right? You might not need it, right. but it's an insurance right. just in case, exactly. right? Yeah. Now, the big one is food hygiene. So don't drink the local water. Always use bottled water. And that includes washing your teeth as well. People don't think about that, but you can get sick. From drinking the local water while you're, you're still your ingesting cheese. it aren't you yeah yes so that's yeah. one big thing that i've noticed that people don't realize there's a lot of good health tips in flight um always be really selective about your seat so if you're paying you know extra money to get a seat make sure you pick a good seat by that what i mean is don't have an aisle seat have a window seat because the aisle seat gets a lot of traffic you're getting a lot of traffic from people and so if you're in a window seat, you're more enclosed and away from that. You know what I mean? Like the, you've got the yeah. flight attendants going up and down, giving you food. You've got people going up and down to go to the toilet or have a bit of an exercise. You're getting a lot of people. That's a, like a really bad traffic area. Another thing to do, um, always have your air on. So you might be feeling a bit cold in flight. Continue the air all the time and push it on you because that's getting the, air, the stale air away from you. And obviously we know this one from the last few years, but wipe everything down. Yeah. Whatever yeah. you touch, wipe down um, and clean regularly. Right. So um, I never really considered how gross airplanes were until this last year, <laughs> until I had to fly for the first time. So so but like paranoid the first time I got on a flight yes. <laughs> in yes. 2021. I've got, I've got other little tips that I won't tell you. They're in the book, but um, okay. having worked we'll in the airline, book, right. I'm, Yes. <laughs> There's other I work to the airline. I know all the all that happens on the plane. So, but then yeah, talking about the safety tips, don't keep all your money in one place. So don't keep all your money together. So if you're going out, don't take all your money with you. It seems like a no-brainer, but you know if you were to be mugged or robbed, everything would be gone. So it's just about well, one thing that I do, and, and you know it might be something that other people do. I separate depending on how many days I'm there. And have it in like little oh, parcels, idea. right? And then separate it through your luggage. Another thing, I wouldn't use a hotel safe ever. All employees have that master code, and if someone wants to go into the safe, they've got the code, irrespective yeah. of the code that you create. Right. <laughs> um, right. And I'm not sure people know that, but they've got the, they've got the master code. So most people are honest, you know, that work at the hotel, but some people yeah. might not be. And don't carry your belongings on your back. This is. You know, some people put their backpacks on their back. Put your backpack on the front so you can actually physically see it. We don't, we can't see anything on the back. I've seen so many people mugged, you know, putting wallets in the back of their pants or putting, um, you know, backpacks on the back. Someone is come, come up from behind you, you can't see them. You can only see them when they've taken off your backpack and taken it with them. So, <laughs> right. um, so it's always about carrying yeah. it. You know, it might look... Might look a bit strange, but carry the backpack on the front with you. Mm -hmm. um, I've learned you just another, can't, don't worry about what other people think how you look when you're traveling. You know, you, you got to take care of yourself yeah. first, right? No, you're never going to see these people again, right? All these other tourists or local people. <laughs> That's right. Exactly right. Yeah. Another great one is make copies of your travel documents. So oh, your passport. Such a good idea. Yeah. And, and again, put it in a separate place. So if you are mugged, they take your passport 
you might you'll have a photocopy of it you'll have the number you'll have everything you need and when you go to your your country's consulate you can quite easily get it reissued yeah. um, it's never happened to me but touch wood <laughs> yeah, right. um, that it won't. <laughs> but it, again it's about the insurance right having the backup if you haven't already gathered i'm a bit of a planner and i think everyone should be if you're a yes. traveler be a planner because it's going to help you um and probably the final thing is register your details with your consulate as well so if anything happens in Australia, um, we've got a facility where we can register where we're going and when, what the dates are, um, and it's really good. So they can contact us. So hopefully there's no natural disasters, but if there was, they could get in contact with us quickly. We have something similar in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S., it's called the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program or STEP. Most of the times you never hear from them, but I was here in Thailand in 2014 when the coup happened, and they were very good about emailing us and just keeping us updated with what was going on and mm-hmm. people don't even know that exists a lot of people don't know that those programs exist yeah so that'd be probably my big tips i think if you you do all those things you're going to be a lot safer and a lot healthier while you travel absolutely so uh, did you learn these tips mostly through experience i have yeah. had things go awry <laughs> um, but luckily i'm still alive but which yeah, is yeah. good um, <laughs> um but but yeah it's it, I, I think Talking to people too, um, you know, when you're a traveller, you talk to people and sure, they tell yeah. you stories about things that have gone wrong as well and you think, oh, I better do that next time and it's in, you sort of put that in your memory bank. So, yeah, some of these things have happened to me probably in my earlier in my overseas yeah. travel journey but yeah. now they're sort of no-brainers, like they're just common common sense, I suppose. But, yeah, I mean, if, if those tips help people, then that's a good thing because it means that they won't experience that. So, yeah, it, it, a little bit of both. But I think when you get into scrapes, when you travel, you always learn something. I try and see it from a positive light that, you know, if an adventure goes wrong, you always learn something from that. That's one of kind of the, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a tagline, but one of our sort of unofficial mottos of our podcast is that good adventures start when things go wrong because that's, that's where the good stories come from that you can sit around telling people. The perfect trips are pretty boring to listen to, I think, for most people. Yeah, like, okay, for sure. Oh, yeah, everything went make good. You're going to remember those adventures where things were a little bit uncomfortable and a little bit chaotic, uh, but you still got something good out of it in the end. I think that's yeah. kind of where the fun of travel comes from, is that it's not always comfortable. Yeah, I think, I think it's us... quite addictive in yeah, a way. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, great. Well, so, you know, you mentioned that you're a planner, and I think that's so important. What are some of your... Uh, best tips for planning a, a trip abroad. What are your strategies for preparing in advance before you go somewhere? So I think you've got to do the research. So if you haven't been to the place, research it. Know what you're going to be up for. Um, is it developing? Is it a developed country? I think if it's a developed country, then you sort of know what you're up for. It's probably similar to where you come from. But if it's a developing country, there's going to be things a little bit new, unique and different. Um, so it's really about... And it's, it's sort of around the health. So you're finding out about the health because that's part of, you know, the vaccinations. But you also want to find out a little bit about the culture. So when you go over there, you're not really offending anyone and you're being respectful to that culture. For me, it's about the research. So first, probably identify where you want to go. And, and around that, are you going to book everything yourself online or are you going to go to a travel agent? So identify that. If you're going to do it online, Great. Um, you're going to save a lot of money if you do that. Um, but obviously it's going to take a little bit more planning. So it's just step by step. Some some people think it's overwhelming to go, all right, I've got to plan that overseas trip. If you look at it as a whole, it probably looks overwhelming. But if you break sure, it down yeah. into steps, step by step. So firstly, you're going to need a flight. Book the flight. Find out about the flight. Or well, firstly, find out when you can have holidays. That's probably the first thing you need to do. Ask your employer, when can yeah. I, when can I have yeah. time off? Yeah. <laughs> get them to approve that. Great, you've got the holidays. Then probably look at the, the flights. What are the flights? Try and find the flights that are, you know, going to be within your price range. Then you're going to need a hotel or accommodation. Think about that. Um, are you going to you drive over there? Are you going to need a car? Or are you going to go on tours? So it's just about breaking it down um, and step by step, have a bit of an itinerary. So, you, you know, you're going to fly out this day. Due to time difference, you might be arriving on a different day. Um, but it's just about the logistics. So it's, for me, it's just 
starting at the thought, where am I going? And it's breaking down it into steps. There's so much, so many good resources on the internet, so many review sites, so many great travel um, websites. My travel website's a great one as well. Absolutely. Um, but and all the, so links, many... all the links will be in our show notes and on our website. So we yeah. will, yeah, if you want to find that, yeah. you can definitely click below. <laughs> yeah. But this, we're, we're really, really lucky. There's so much. All you've got to do is yeah. Google if that's what you do. Okay, yeah. Google, and there's so many. And all you've got to do is put the country name um, or do it like a keyword search, and you can get so much information. So we're really lucky. There's so much out there. Um, so it's just about planning it. So once all that's planned, what I do is I book it ahead of time. So that's all covered for financially. And then it's about, okay, we've got to pack. And that's about what time I need to be at the airport, get the Uber or the, the cab. And it's just about step by step. Once you get there, you should be able to relax really because you've done all that preparation, you've done all that planning. Um, so you've done all the hard yards before you've left. And then it's just about keeping yourself safe and healthy while you're over there yeah. and enjoying yourself really. That's what we're traveling for, right. aren't we? To see Absolutely. the new, to, to relax and hopefully yeah. stay out of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. What are some of your uh, favorite resources for finding this information? Like say you want to go to a new country you've never been. You want to find out about the culture or health risks, safety risks. What sources do you tend to gravitate towards? Obviously, we, we Google and we look for you know things in general, but do you have mm. any sources that you find to be really valuable in your planning? So, so, yeah, depending on the country, I will go to their local airline because it's usually got a lot of great um, local information. Right. Also, I look okay. at the tourist, bu tourist bureaus. So most countries will have a tourist um, office, so I will go onto their website. Um, also, what I really love is TripAdvisor for reviews. So when you're trying to work out what hotel you want to stay on, TripAdvisor is excellent, but there's also other review sites that are really good. Um, and also Expedia, I really love as well. That's got a lot of good good information. But, you know, I, I think about, okay, so I might want to go to um, the States. I will go on to all the airline web, websites, so American, Delta, and find out what I can find out from their airline site. I also go on the, um, normally in Australia, we've got local tourist bureaus for each country. So we've got a US tourist bureau. I will oh, then investigate yeah. it. Um, I don't know whether you've got that there, but within Australia, they've got like every country pretty much a tourist bureau represented in Australia. So I will go go there as well as the local, um, you know, international websites. Um, but yeah, I'd do that to start with. Um, I'd also look up tours because to, the tours, if you Google the tours of that country, you also get a lot of information. You might not go on that tour, but it'll give you things that you might not have thought of doing. It, it may seem like common sense, but it's things that people don't think about. I mean, I've never even thought about looking at other, you know, airline websites. That's such a good idea. What do you think are the biggest mistakes that people make in planning a trip? Not having travel insurance is one mm, big thing. Yeah. And not um, not looking at the, the currency. Also, currency is a big thing. I don't know whether I mentioned it, but not looking at the currency rates um, is a really big big thing that people make mistakes with. If you purchase a currency here or look to see when it's positive, you're better off actually purchasing it at home before you actually get over there. But it depends on the country you're talking about. So in Asia, for instance, you actually get a better rate when you arrive there. But in certain countries, if you keep an eye on the currency before you leave, you're actually saving yourself some money. Another big thing that people do I, th I think personally is go to a travel agent because you're paying for their commission. Yes, they're planning it for you. So, I mean, look, there's always going to be opportunity to have either a travel agent or do it yourself. But the big mistake people make is they go to a travel agent. That travel agent is actually going to push things that are going to give them the best commission. And it may not be suited to what you actually want to do. And I know that because I was a travel agent and we used to push. <laughs> right. But I, I think not planning is, is a big thing as well. Not to say that you can plan for everything. Like things happen that you can't control, right? Yeah. And that's the beauty of travel. But, yeah, that's probably my, my top, I would say. Yes. Well, you know, you are our first guest that we've had from Australia. So I'd also like to talk to you about some of your favorite places to travel in Australia. 
and give some local tips for people that might want to visit. So what are some of your top destinations for someone that's never been to Australia that might want to? Um, look, everyone thinks of Sydney and Melbourne when they think of Australia. I know I do. There's a, yeah. really, there's a yeah. really untouched place called Adelaide in South Australia. That is a fabulous place. Not a lot of people go there, I would say, internationally. The shopping is phenomenal. They've got, a, as I mentioned before, the Barossa Valley, which is a fantastic yeah. winery. They've actually got a place called um, Harndorf, actually, I think it's called, um, which is a German, uh, it's a, like a german theme little town. A lot of Germans came to South Australia um, and oh, they've made it their own. So that's a really awesome place to travel to. Very cheap as well. People probably know about the Gold Coast in Brisbane. So that's where all the, everyone goes for all the sun. Um, but another really great place is Perth. You've probably seen the little quokkas, little quokkas, oh, like them. the little wallabies <laughs> with the smiley little faces. I love them. I always, I've always wanted to meet one in real life. <laughs> yeah. So what you've got to do is you've got to travel to Perth, which is a bit of a trip. So it's probably about a three and a half to four hour journey from, say, Sydney. But if you go to a place called Rottnest Island, that's where the quokkas are. They'd probably be my big tips. And if you love beaches, if you're in Western Australia, so if you're in near Perth, if you go up the coast, there's a place called Broome. They've got phenomenal beaches. The water is just crystal clear and the beaches are so clean. I, I could talk for hours about Australia. There's so many places. If you come to Australia, you would need to spend a few weeks here. And don't just, as, mu as much as I love Sydney and Melbourne, because they both I both love them, there's so many other places within Australia that will blow your mind just to visit. Uh, what yeah. is the best way to get around? Do you, do you recommend mostly driving or is there a good train system? What do you what do you recommend if you want to see Australia? It depends on the amount of time you've got here. So if you've only got a limited time, then you're probably better off getting in a plane. But what I would say, there's some really good journeys. So if you say you had a month or four months like we had, maybe not, if, say, you're interested in going from the east coast to over um, the west coast over in Perth, there's actually some really great train journeys that you can take. So there's a thing called an Indian Pacific, which takes you from Perth or um, vice versa, from the east coast over to the west, western part. You'll okay. go over the Nullarbor Plains, which is a really untouched place of Australia. But, yeah, there's a lot of train journeys. And there's another one, the GAN, which goes up through the middle of Australia, up through from Darwin right all the way down to Adelaide and South Australia. But I would say probably your best bet is flying if you haven't got a lot of time. Are there any specific health and safety tips for Australia that people might not be aware of? Now, I know that this might be a, a stereotype. I know that there's a lot of dangerous animals. But how can a, a traveler stay safe in Australia? Yeah, don't approach a kangaroo unless it's in a, you know, like a... a, a oh, that's, a that's good, because they look really park. cute, don't they? <laughs> look, I can tell you a bit of a story. Where I live, we've got a, a reserve on the other side of the road, and we've got kangaroos wow. that, that, wow. that visit, a family of kangaroos. You do not want to approach them. They are so huge. Their tails, the tails of the ones that live near, near me, are bigger than my arm and probably my leg combined. Oh, my gosh. They are such powerful animals, so beautiful though, such beautiful animals. They only eat grass. I don't know how they become so strong. They are very strong and they're very, they've are very. got very big broad backs, I suppose you could uh -huh. call it. But, yeah, don't ever approach a wild kangaroo because they'll get quite distressed. Um, they'll probably hop away anyway because they'll, they'll be frightened. But if you were in the position that you were next to one, go the other direction. I'll tell you a quick little story. They tend to come round very um, at the beginning of the mornings before the sun rises and also in really cool weather. One time I was going to work when we actually went to work. Yeah. There was one yeah. of my foot paths eating grass. I turned my head and saw him or her and they saw me and it was sort of like, and he was only quite a few metres away, but he was too busy eating the grass. Yeah. I, was, I would not have gone through that path because I would have ended up in hospital. So I went the other direction turning and looking at my back just to make sure that they weren't following me. But, yeah, if they're startled, you, you've just got to really watch the kangaroos. With koalas, you're not going to really see them because they're going to be sloping up a tree. But if you see them, um, they'll probably run away from you as well. We've got wombats, which are quite cuddly as well. They'll probably run away. Be careful with the dingoes. If you're in the middle of Australia, be really careful with the dingoes because they are wild and feral dogs and they... 
you could end up having to have a tetanus needle, I think, if one of them bit you. So you've got to be really careful there. We've got a lot of spiders and snakes as well. So if you see a snake, just get out of there quickly. And we've got some spiders that are quite deadly. We've got a funnel web spider, if you're in New South Wales, that if you get bitten by that, you'll die if you don't get to hospital quickly. And redbacks are quite deadly. as They're not deadly, but they'll give you a good bite. I've been bitten by a, a spider, so I've got first-hand experience. One tip that you need to do is if you're bitten by a spider, kill it and put it in, a, in some sort of jar and take it with Absolutely. you to the hospital. So what I did in the middle of summer, because we have quite hot summers here, I was taking clothes yeah. off the line and there was one hiding inside the basket. And as I was taking the clothes out, it jumped on my arm and bit me. So you've got to be really careful, especially in the summertime in Australia. Shake everything out, especially your clothes. Once you've been bitten by a spider, you shake the clothes and you, you always make sure that, um, you know, that it's it nothing, nothing in there. <laughs> right. That's it. It hasn't got a yeah. family. Just be careful. You know, there's some really lovely animals here, but this, we've got some deadly, deadly ones as well. So, yeah, right. take care of yourself. Right. Awesome. Well, Linda, are there any other stories or, or messages you'd like to share to the people today at the podcast before we finish up? Be brave. Traveling is wonderful. Um, adventures are what makes us, I think, you know, makes our life. Um, I love that. If you think you can't do it, if you think you can't do it, just do it anyway, right? Take the tips, you know, make sure you've prepared yourself. But, you know, we're only on the, the planet for a short amount of time and I think we've got to live our life and I think life's to be enjoyed, an adventure, if you think about it, when you get become older, you'll look back and go, wow, what a life I've had. And you'll think back to those adventures. You could even have enough adventures to write a book, um, yeah. you know, depending on what, yeah. what happens. But, yeah, be brave. If you want tips on how to do things, there's so many resources out, out there that will help you. But it's just having that confidence. And I think it's about doing it once. First time's going to be a bit scary. But once you've done it once, you should be able to do it from then on. If you just you'll build your confidence and all those other adventures will be out there waiting for you. And the world's such an amazing place. I don't think we ever get to the whole we only do a small part, but it's so amazing and you, you you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't go out and have those adventures and travel. Well, you've written four books and we can find those on Amazon. Do you have any other books that are in the works or any other projects that you have in the works right now? Yes, I've got a bit of a travel memoir talking oh, about wow. adventures. So I'm, I've done the first draft on that, so I'm going through and doing a bit of a revision on that. So hoping that, hoping to have that out this year. Yeah, that was. I love reading um, travel memoirs. You're going to have to send me an email when it's when it's live, and I'll I'll definitely have to go and read that. I love travel memoirs. Yes, they're true stories. It's, it's about what happened to me, but also about the people I met. Because I think that's really important. They they play a big part in the in the stories. Other than that, I'm probably got some more tra smart travelista guide um, books up my sleeve. Um, but getting the travel memoir done first, and then yeah, just probably doing a few more events, travel events. So yeah. participate in a travel event, virtual travel event last year. Probably um, getting involved in a few more this year. But yeah, look, there's so many things to do, and never enough time, Michael to do that right. Um, <laughs> right what you can guarantee that is, is i'll have my head in travel probably for a very long time probably for the rest of my life but yeah if you want to want to, want to know about any updates um or any new things on the website um i've got a number of newsletters that you can sign up for that will you know talk about the book updates and also the travel updates as right. well so yeah and we will have uh, and, we'll have links to all of that links to all your social media where to find you all of that uh in our show notes and on our website so it'll be really great. easy for everyone to get in touch with you uh with just a click <laughs> yeah and i love feedback and i love people reaching out that really makes my day when i get an email so um, I encourage people to do that because i love it the engagement is the best part of what i do i think right so what are your next adventures i know that travel's still a little hard right now thanks to covid but once this is all over, what are your next big adventures? Where do you want to go next? I've got a bit of shopping withdrawal, so I'll probably go to Honolulu. Is that a good shopping yeah, destination? I'm, I didn't know that. Yes. I've never been. Um, <laughs> oh, I've been many times, so it's probably uh, not okay. a new adventure for me, but it'll feel like a new adventure considering we haven't travelled for a little bit. But then after that, probably next year, I will be doing another Europe trip, visiting some countries in Europe that I haven't seen probably Greece. Also looking to see the Northern Lights, big thing on I've my bucket list. I always wanted to see that. Yeah, um, 
So I've went started. I went to Scandinavia before COVID. Um, went up to Sweden, but I want to investigate a few more countries and probably go up to I think I think it's either Iceland or Greenland where you get a better chance of seeing the Northern Lights. So that'll be on the cards. Linda, thank you so much for coming on the show, and we want to tell all of our listeners again to go check out the Smart Travelista, check out your books. And, yeah, when your travel memoirs come out, we really uh, would love to uh, read those. We'll definitely be talking about that on the show. And maybe you can come back sometime in the future to talk about writing a travel memoir because that's um, a really interesting thing that we've never talked about on the show either. It's something that I'm really interested in and have always wanted to do. Well, thank you yes. so much for coming on the show today. I had a ton of fun. Really appreciate all your insight and your practical tips. Thank you, Michael. It's been a pleasure. Right. And James, we're back. All right. Yeah. Very so, good. Yeah. First of all, thank you, Linda, for coming on the show. It was fantastic. And uh, just a little reminder, Linda has actually suggested our upcoming monthly challenge, which is travel writing. So Linda is a travel writer. And her suggestion was that we do a written monthly challenge, do a little travel writing for us, make it as exciting and as evocative as you can. Now, James, have you ever been in an experience where you have had to worry about travel, health, and safety? Has has that ever come up? Because it doesn't always happen, mm. like we mentioned. It's one of those things where you hope it never happens, but it's better to be prepared, as they teach us in the Boy Scouts. Have you ever actually had to deal with that? No, mm -hmm. not really. Um, I've been lucky in that any injuries that I have sustained or other people around me have sustained while traveling mm -hmm. have been very minor. Yeah. Um. Things like being stung by a scorpion, or right. which can be very serious if you're allergic. That's why I always keep. I, I don't know how true this is. Nobody mm -hmm. like take my medical advice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but my yeah, please don't. I am not a trained medical professional in any way. I'm a phlebotomist. <laughs> I can do that. I can draw your blood. That's it. <laughs> um. So, folks, there was a little recording issue here. James is telling a story, but unfortunately, it didn't record part of it. So I will start us out. So one time, James was camping, and he got stung by a scorpion, and his old scoutmaster happened to have some cigarettes in his first aid kit. Now, he also smoked cigarettes, so I mean, I don't know if... He said they were multi-purpose. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, <laughs> they were his emergency stash, and they served a purpose, because I got stung by a scorpion, which, let me tell you, sucks. It hurts so much. I've never had that happen. <laughs> Apparently, and it worked for me, is you take some of the tobacco out of the cigarette and you like moisten it in your mouth and then you put that on the scorpion sting. And it's sort of like, I don't know if it draws the, the venom out. I don't know if it just is a placebo. I don't know, but it worked. And all I, I mean, know is it it fixed me. Nicotine is kind of, isn't it like a very minor like numbing agent as well? Could that? Yeah. And so it might've it numbed it? it. It might've. Yeah. In the tobacco, and I'm pretty sure tobacco has been used as for as for medicinal purposes. For, right. Yeah. Who knows? But all I know is that it worked. Oh, and there's a bunch of chemicals and other crap in there too. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I always keep I always keep a few loose just loose cigarettes in my first aid kit. Interesting. Now because I've never that. heard that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have been. Let me tell you. I would almost rather have an injury mm -hmm. than deal with like food poisoning while traveling. Ugh. Yeah. I would rather like break my arm almost. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds extreme, but at least that you can deal with it. <laughs> no, man. I, I once I was in Burma. This is the only time I've had food poisoning while traveling. I have a really strong stomach. I eat street food all the time, so I don't get sick all that often, but I had some fermented bamboo, which is a bad idea. Um, the night before I had to go on an overnight train and I got horrible, horrible food poisoning. And I was incredibly sick i couldn't eat anything for like over 24 hours and this train was awful this train was so uncomfortable dirty old the beds were like thin mattresses they were damp the window was stuck open and it was raining and we were getting soaked and this is a first class compartment um, it was terrible uh what the was tracks coach like <laughs> i don't know but the tracks hadn't been repaired for like 60 years like they were the old british tracks it was an extension of the death railway so like the train was bouncing all night and just like I was just sitting there kind of just like holding my stomach, feeling so sick. And the toilet was just like a toilet, but it was just a hole that would open up onto the tracks. 
it was so dirty and so gross. And it was like one of my worst traveling experiences I've ever had. I food remember, poisoning while traveling is just awful. Uh, didn't you also, was that the same train where you like made a friend? Yeah. And yeah, had, there like, was this a friend's thing. There was this French girl and she was in another compartment, but she was with some local guys who were making her feel uncomfortable. And so we had already met her because we had accidentally been sent her ticket by the travel agency or the, the train, the train booking agency. So we had had to run up to the, the train office or whatever and exchange tickets with her. And so we had already known her. And so like in the middle of the night, she came knocking on our door because uh, my wife and I had booked out the entire compartment because we didn't want that to happen. There were four beds. And so yep. we had just bought the whole thing because we didn't want to be with strangers. Uh, and it's a good thing we did because this girl was getting, uh, I don't, I'm not going to say she was getting harassed, but she was starting to feel uncomfortable by the people in her compartment, mm-hmm. the local guys. And so she, uh, I guess, saw us as just a, a tourist couple. She saw us as a safer option. So she came and she stayed with us. Yeah, and, it, and you're, and you're a married couple and you know, it's, it's just, yeah. Right, yeah. Right. But anyway, again, safety tips, <laughs> make, make a friend. I don't know. <laughs> sure. Sure. But no, I got food poisoning. The last time I was in Thailand, I remember that you're on the, we went you're on to the island. Koh, you? We were on Koh, what Koh Samet. I was fine. We were there for, I think, three days. I was fine, fine, fine. And then one day, but it was like weird food poisoning because, like, I would the normal food poisoning stuff, but then it was just like horrible, horrible, just like pain. I don't know what yeah. it was. It was weird. Yeah. However, so then we had to then take a speedboat from the island to the mainland, which that's bumpy. <laughs> right. And then. <laughs> It was either going to be what a five hour bus ride or like mm-hmm. a one and a half hour taxi ride. Yeah. And so I paid <laughs> like a lot of money <laughs> for, for a taxi, taxi directly back to Bangkok. Yeah. Directly back to Bangkok. And and let me tell you, I have never felt worse. I remember when you knocked on my door when you were back home, like you were like white as a ghost. You were so pale. I was you looked awful. <laughs> like in that night when I was sleeping, like I got a fever and like chills and shaking. Yeah. And then the next day I was fine, which is how food yeah. poisoning works. Mm. So that's, that was my worst experience, I think. Yeah. And that's, I've never fun. really been injured. I've never really had to deal with a whole lot. Really bad yeah. sunburn will mess you up, but that's just me being stupid. <laughs> anyway, it is time for our not... favorite segment, Adventures in the News. And this week it's your turn. Mm-hmm. What have you got for us today? I found one that I was hoping was good, but then it has a paywall. I can't, oh, I hate paywalls. Anyway, so the title is An Improbable 6,000 Mile Boat Trip Around the East Coast. It says, Joining up with the Great Loop, an intricate route that transforms half the United States into an island. Whoa. Now, since I cannot get into the article, let's see if you can pulse anything up real quick. But it could okay. also be fun to just speculate. The Great Loop. Yeah. Okay. I found it. There's actually a Wikipedia article about the Great Loop. The Great Loop is a system of waterways that encompasses the eastern portion of the United States and part of Canada. It is made up by both natural and man-made waterways, including the Atlantic and Gulf, intercoastal waterways, the Great Lakes, the Rideau Canal and the Mississippi and Tennessee Tom Bigby waterways. The entire loop stretches about 6,000 miles. Wow. So it looks like it goes from, I mean, the Mississippi all the way from like the eastern border of Louisiana, then up through the Great Lakes, then all the way around down the East Coast, down past Florida. It's, it's massive. Uh, the people that do it are called loopers. I mean, if you had like a houseboat, you could just go for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it would be fun. That would be a fun adventure just to get to get even a little i mean i don't know because the, the, the hard part the scary part is going to be the atlantic when you're there unless you're just like really hugging yeah the i mean like like i'm pretty sure even at the widest part of the mississippi river you can still see both sides you can do a little know, but that's do a little neat. huck fin and just raft it yeah and just build a log raft and just <laughs> get you a buddy and just hang mm-hmm. out that's actually really cool i had not heard of that that would be, that would be a fun adventure mm-hmm. so if anyone is out there and they're looking for a grand adventure why not boat the Great Loop? That's really cool. That Yeah, that's totally new for me. I've never heard of that. Yeah, I had no idea that existed <laughs> at <Wow>. all. <laughs> so depending on the speed of travel, the route can take as little as two months. So most people take a year to complete. Uh, the route can also be completed in segments. So it's kind of like the Appalachian Trail where you can do it in segments. Mm-hmm. Loopers can begin at any point along the route. And when they return to their starting point, they are said to have, quote, crossed their wake and to have finished the Great Loop. That's pretty cool i didn't know i didn't know this existed james how much is a (laughs) how much is the cheapest pontoon boat 
let's go let's go to the great loop <laughs> for, a, for attempt adventure let's see if i just uh cheap um i can get an inflatable um canoe for 199 dollars all right well if anyone genuinely donates us 199 dollars then james and i will attempt a portion of the great loop that's a attempt <laughs> adventure an uncovered guaranteed. inflatable <laughs> we're not gonna uncovered. get very far we'll get as far as we can <laughs> Yep. We're going to check the weight limit because um, that'll be another issue. We're not small men. No, we're not. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for listening to us ramble. Thanks for listening to us talk about the Great Loop. If you enjoyed the show today, please don't forget to subscribe. And again, if you have the time, please consider giving us a review on whatever podcast app that you choose. We're on pretty much all of them. Maybe a five-star review if you're feeling generous and you liked the episode. You can also visit us at www attemptadventure.com where you can find show notes pictures and again that's the best way to contact us as well just click the little contact button absolutely thank you for listening and until next time keep adventuring